Welcome everyone. I'm Penny Lewis, the Executive Director of the Ecological Landscape Alliance, and I'll be the moderator for today's webinar, Designing a Patchwork Ecology in Urban Ecosystems. This is part of the Focus on Sustainability webinar series, a series developed by a group of organizations known regionally for their quality ecological education. And by collaborating on these webinars, we expand the reach of our individual programs. In case you're not familiar with our organizations, they're largely nonprofit and volunteer groups in the United States. The regional groups are the Ecological Landscape Alliance, the Chesapeake Conservation Landscaping Council, the Illinois Landscape Contractors Association Sustainability Committee, the Kansas City Native Plant Initiative, and Rescape California. If you have a question for the presenter, you may ask it by typing in the question box at any time during the broadcast, and we'll be addressing all of your questions at the end of the presentation. And now I would like to introduce our presenter, David Sider. David is director, design director, and founding principal of Future Green Studio, a design and build firm specializing in landscape, urbanism, and ecology. David's design portfolio encompasses award-winning private and public use projects. He's also the author of Spontaneous Urban Plants, Weeds in New York City. Mr. Sider holds an MLA from the University of Pennsylvania and is a licensed landscape architect in New Jersey, Maryland, and Virginia. Welcome, David. Thank you so much, Penny. And thank you to uh, the Ecological uh, Landscape Alliance for having me. Really excited to talk about plants and urban ecology today. The title of the presentation is called Designing a Patchwork Ecology in Urban Ecosystems. And what I'd like to do is walk you through our um, kind of firm's approach to design and our process of kind of looking and analyzing the conditions of the city and then how we take those, that analysis and then apply it to built forms in our projects. So uh, Future Green is a uh, landscape design and urban ecology firm that was founded in 2008. Um, and we're a collection of artists and uh, architects and landscape architects, builders and construction managers that come together to realize you know, bespoke landscape projects within the urban environment. And our projects um, really range a lot in scale and size, but what we've understood over the past 10 years is that um, all of these small scale interventions together through their aggregation begin to create this patchwork ecological system of landscape within the city. So our approach really begins with looking and we look at our existing environment and we analyze the different ways that plants start to take root in our urban environment, whether it be through um, fence conditions or kind of networks within paving, seams between different adjacent surfaces. Um, these are the conditions of our urban ecology that we're interested in exploring. And so that work, uh, you know, includes mapping, but also includes a lot of analysis through photography. We allowed ourselves to be kind of push and pull through the city uh, by the plants that we find and the unique places that we find them growing in. And then we think about how to take those strategies that these plants are using to survive and then apply it to our built work. And this takes on all sorts of different forms, be it street side gardens, kind of resilient green roofs, window boxes and green walls, you know, pocket gardens, all of these kind of different strategies which begin to kind of make up um, our urban landscape environment. So we use these uh, strategies to develop a certain kit of parts, a kind of uh, typological index of all sorts of different interventions that we can begin to kind of add to the city. And then these strategies in turn contribute vital ecological and human services. And so I'll talk a little bit about more, that, more about that today. Again, our work kind of sits at the interface of, of design. Uh, this is the Brooklyn Children's Museum. Research, our book on spontaneous urban plants. Fabrication, uh, the rooftop of the Metropolitan Museum of Art, uh, where we collaborated with the artist Dan Graham. 
and then community uh, partnerships where we can work with an organization here in Brooklyn, New York, like Gowanus Canal Conservancy, um, about doing these pop-up gardens to educate people about stormwater management. And then revisioning, how can we really rethink our entire cityscape as we move towards um, climate change, um, further kind of impacting our urban environment, stressing out our, uh, our urban landscapes, how can we create a resilient framework for the future? Our work really starts with a lot of um, analysis and, and looking at the existing urban environment around us. And so I'm gonna briefly uh, touch on a couple of research projects that we worked on uh, over the past um, 10 years, leading into some of our design work and really then focusing upon specific plants themselves. So this is our project profiles of spontaneous urban plants, where we essentially mapped um, and highlighted plants within our uh, own streetscape in front of our office, um, indicating them to the passerby that um, something was going on here, something was unique or special about this plant. So it was a little kind of art project, but then coupled with that and the photographs that we took of the plants themselves, we created these uh, botanical illustrations. So we photographed the plants uh, from our yard, bare rooted, and we researched their histories. And we kind of looked at where the plants were coming from, were they native or not? What strategies were they using to survive in these really tough conditions? And then what ecological services might they offer? And it's through this process for us of reframing these plants that are tr traditionally overlooked and over underutilized and making people kind of pay attention a little bit more um, to the plants within their urban environment. We ourselves felt like it was as, as plants people and as designers that there was something missing. We didn't know what these plants were that were all around us. And so through this process of investigation, we began to kind of reveal uh, part of the mundane and part of the overlooked part of our everyday daily lives. And then that took on some other forms. So our project Spontaneous Urban Plants um, was a uh, design competition where we looked at using the platform of Instagram to create a user-generated database of weeds. And so we went out as a studio and mapped uh, trajectories through each of the five boroughs here in New York City, using plants as the kind of guide to push and pull us through the city. And then from there, we generated a website called spontaneousurbanplants.org, which looks at um, plants within our urban environment. And this can be uh, contributed to by uh, taking a photograph with Instagram and hashtagging it spontaneous urban plants. And then it gets uploaded to our website where we identify the plant and allow people to search by the plant type themselves, as well as the kind of ecological service that the plant offers. And that has led to a lot of um, investigations with local school groups or local nonprofit organizations, getting kids to really start to look around at their urban environment and uh, have a greater kind of information with which to create value judgments about what plants are appropriate and which conditions. So the next phase of that became a book, which is uh, Spontaneous Urban Plants, Weeds in New York City, which was published in 2016. And what it is is a real photographic index of the different urban plants that we find. And so the book is organized by ecosystem services. Um, knowing that many of these plants offer a variety of ecosystem services, but knowing that particular plants are uh, especially adept at carbon sequestration or um, um, erosion control or the mitigation of the urban heat island effect, all kind of elements that we want to uh, look at the capabilities of these plants to provide to us as urban dwellers. So here are just a couple of preview or chapter uh, pages from the book itself. And again, the key here was to frame these plant, reframe these plants through the kind of filters of Instagram and photography and elevate their status and then also make people realize that there's all these kind of ecological systems 
uh, services that the plants themselves offer, as well as some ecological disservices. So it's not a uh, situation where we're trying to tell everybody all weeds are wonderful, but we want people to look more critically and to think more specifically about sites and which plants might be available um, to offer benefits to us in particular areas. Moving forward um, within the field of landscape architecture and landscape design in cities, we're, we feel like there's a unique opportunity to inhabit our built environment um, in, in ways that were traditionally done uh, 10 or 20 years ago. And that's through the opportunities that we find in walls, roofs, lots, and streets within our urban fabric. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about a couple of projects which fit within each of these categories, and then the specific plants that we used uh, for those categories. <clears throat> this um, is our project 41 Bond um, in Manhattan. <clears throat> And the uh, project started with a site visit to a quarry in upstate New York, where we looked at the kind of sedimentary bluestone that was gonna be used for the facade itself and saw plants growing out through the cracks um, within the stone itself. And it generated this idea that maybe we could integrate plants into the facade itself. So you see here 24 integrated window boxes into the northern facade of the building, a planted canopy over the residential entrance, and then a planted loggia and tree pit at the ground floor. This is after a couple of years of installation where the plants have really taken off. Um, these are maintained through operable uh, windows um, and there's integrated irrigation and drainage system built into the facade of the building. And there was a legibility with the planting the design that the plants really needed to read from the street as an overall kind of street garden. But yet these plants were outside of people's individual rooms and so therefore they needed to have, have like a specimen like quality to the plants themselves. So this is this uh, particular project and the plants that I'm gonna highlight here are probably the most garden-like of um, any of the projects that I'll share with you today, and probably the less <laughs> least urban-like. Um, but what, what they do offer um, are kind of unique capabilities for window box uh, and wall conditions. And so we looked at um, the plants which might be found um, in our urban environment, like Boston Ivy, and then looked at slight derivations of those. Um, Fenway Park is a particular cultivar with a real chartreuse colored leaf um, that looks fantastic throughout the year. And then again, with that traditional, really fantastic fall color um, that Boston Ivy brings. So this plant uh, graced a lot of the different facade uh, points. It was uh, planted in six of the window boxes and it started as kind of launching points um, throughout that facade treatment. And then other smaller growing plants that have the ability to cascade or uh, spill out over the ledges of the window boxes themselves. Um, this is a more traditional garden plant that we find kind of growing um, in steppable conditions. It's got an inherent resiliency to it and a small um, spire like uh, flower. Another uh, plant which many of you are probably familiar with um, is the Hookera velosa, Autumn Bride. There's many different cultivars which could be successful in this condition. But as you see in the upper right image, this is a plant that we find growing in our native condition, really out of rock faces. Um, and it's got the ability to withstand a lot of kind of uh, difficult conditions. And again, kind of hang and spill over the edge, creating a lush kind of foliage, but also with a really nice flower that comes up and can be red in the interior uh, of the building as well. One of our favorite kind of wall or green, green wall or, or hanging plants is this box leaf honeysuckle, um, Linicera palata hohing uh, krumer is uh, the particular uh, cultivar that we've used. Um, it's got really nice um, arching branches 
that again kind of break the edges of a traditional planter box and spill out over the front of the building, creating kind of dramatic hanging effects um, from the window boxes themselves. And then another plant many of you are probably very familiar with that adds evergreen structure um, to uh, the installation, um, the Camerociparis uh, golden mop. Um, this uh, false cypress, you know, is not an urban plant and would never kind of grow on the street, but in these wall conditions can be a really great balance to some of the other perennials uh, that we might select. And again, provide that kind of structure for the garden throughout the four seasons. You know, these uh, planter boxes were really intimate, um, intimately uh, situated next to the interiors of the building. And so it really needed to have a kind of four seasonal um, aspect to the planting design. And then um, another uh, great uh, shade tolerant plant for often kind of northern facade uh, would be the Hakanakloa. Um, it's got something that really kind of dances in the wind and again can kind of spill out of planter boxes and create that kind of dramatic effect uh, along buildings. Another project that looks at wall treatments is our project Atlantic Plumbing in Washington, D.C. It was the old uh, Atlantic Plumbing Supply Company, a kind of light industrial building. And when we found the parcel itself, it was really covered within uh, spontaneous urban plants. And so we did a kind of exhaustive analysis um, of all the different plant types that we found on site, over 100 uh, different uh, varieties, and looked at what, what those plants were doing, the size and shape, and whether there was something that we could kind of pull from the strategies that they were using and integrate that into the proposed building design. So we threw a lot of different ideas in our conceptual design phase at the project, um, vine shafts with vines to kind of grow up the building, or uh, these long linear window boxes, which could uh, grace the western facade of the building, um, as well as more traditional kind of green roofs. And one of the things that really stuck was, was this idea of window boxes. So you see a kind of built, uh, in installed photo here. We're standing on the third floor terrace of the building. It's a, a kind of more traditional green roof with a green, green canopy off to the right of the image. And then the window boxes kind of gracing the western facade. These are all 300 foot long um, with integrated irrigation and drainage and are maintained as part of a window washing system um, a couple of times a year. So again, these, these plants were really outside of people's living spaces. And so, and yet we knew that they weren't going to be robustly maintained in terms of having a gardener be able to visit them every other week, um, as you might traditionally find um, in these types of spaces. So with that kind of limited maintenance capability, we wanted to design something that was really robust. And then obviously when you're um, thinking about landscape integrated into structures, we have all sorts of other technical uh, complexities, like the structural load of the, the planters themselves carry and the complexities of getting irrigation and drainage um, to the window boxes themselves. So we wanted to minimize the amount of soil and thus the weight that we were imposing upon the building and yet get the most volume out of the plants themselves. There's all sorts of other, you know, interesting kind of relationships between interior and exterior, using a lot of kind of vine screens, kind of lobby planters, uh, tenant, uh, you know, farming uh, opportunities up on the rooftop, as well as kind of more traditional amenitized roof spaces. So some of the plants that we looked at for the window boxes specifically was this uh, plant, Purple Love Grass. One of my personal favorites. Um, it's just got a great color. It's got a great, great kind of like cloud-like feel to it, um, and the, its resiliency is 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 pretty much can't be beat. Um, so for the window box condition, we felt like this was a real winner. It could be, you know, cut down in late fall or early spring, depending on the preference, um, and yet be really resilient in its growth pattern.
We also used um, um, uh, annual that would self-seed um, eastern daisy flea bait that was uh, specified through a seed mix, something that could have a variability to it and a kind of ephemerality. So that we could introduce it in particular locations and then through its own kind of self-sowing strategy, it would kind of populate other areas of the window boxes and the third floor garden below. Um, the wild uh, bergamot, it's also a fantastic plant, very adapted to uh, dry and uh, rugged conditions. It's got a great uh, flower um, in June, July, and a great kind of resiliency to its, uh, to, again, a great kind of resilient capabilities. Um, and then it also gets, uh, you know, 24 to 30 inches tall and provides some nice height um, within those window boxes to kind of balance some of the other lower growing species. The calico aster, you know, obviously coming out later in the season and providing like um, the aragrostis, these kind of cloud-like masses of flowers um, that that get a lot of volume from a very kind of shallow soil profile. And then uh, a traditional native plant, but also one that we find growing in many urban environments along roadsides and within um, paving um, would be yarrow. And so this, this plant is, you know, often cultivated uh, with different colors and used in different garden, garden strategies. Um, but we also find this plant is a great um, kind of native urban adapted plant that is excellent to kind of use in um, perennial and grass mixes. So we're going to move on to roots, where we begin to kind of talk about plants that have, um, again, similar strategies, but uh, are more applicable to kind of roof conditions than wall conditions. I'm going to start by talking about a project of ours adjacent to Brooklyn Bridge Park in um, Brooklyn, New York, called Empire Stores. Um, it's a historic coffee warehouse um, that's situated between Brooklyn and Manhattan bridges along the waterfront. There's also just strategies that we thought, you know, about the building itself and how to kind of create these um, island planters uh, that could be benches, but also be uh, robust kind of planting islands. You see an overall plan, plan of the building that looks at all the different terraces. It's got um, over uh, 50,000 square feet of green roofs and all sorts of, as well as a kind of um, fifth floor publicly accessible roof terrace that I'm highlighting here. This is the project installed itself. Um, kind of in progress. Um, these areas on the sixth and seventh floor have been fully developed at this point. Um, what you're looking down on is a fifth floor uh, public terrace and the kind of island planters I was describing. We really start here kind of imagining what the space can be through materials and through planting strategies to create these kind of immersive conditions um, that allow people to have exposure to um, plants that might not traditionally find in gardens, um, but yet the opportunity to kind of take in the view uh, through simple seeding strategies. So we've got these built-in chaise lounges, and then you can see the really robust planters there uh, with uh, single-stemmed amylank here and um, shrubby uh, fringe trees. And then I'll speak about some of the other uh, grasses and perennials that we find. Parapet bars and all sorts of nice features, uh, all made with reclaimed wood from the um, building's interior. And then green roofs. Uh, so here we were given um, roughly six inches of soil depth. Uh, it's all the building could uh, structurally allow. And so we wanted to create um, as much volume with that six inches as, as we could. And so we looked uh, to plant very uh, small material. Everything was delivered as, as plugs and use a mix of agastache and goldenrod and grasses to create this really um, 
immersive green roof condition. And then there's ground floor planters that abut the uh, riverfront and provide um, kind of buffers for um, uh, sidewalk cafes. So some of the plants that we uh, found to be really successful on this site, uh, the narrow leaf ironweed, which has got foliage very similar to Amsonia, but it's got this great purple flower. Um, again, you know, drought tolerant, urban adapted plant um, that's got very, a very vigorous growth pattern and quite a bit of volume for the um, soil depth that it, um, that we've given it. So integrating, um, you know, perennials <clears throat> like the ironweed with other grasses like prairie drop seed, um, you know, can create again these kind of wild and yet kind of um, cloud-like forms uh, within the landscape that again allow some amount of kind of immersion of the urban dweller um, and kind of break down the traditional lines of kind of architecture and geometry um, to kind of soften those and again create these very immersive conditions. So the Sparabolus is, is a really excellent green roof plant, can be planted as a plug and then within that first year you're getting almost um, you know the full growth um, and within two years the, the entire roof is really uh, taken off. The heath aster also, I mean, asters is a general rule. There's so many that are applicable for the types of conditions that we're talking about. Um, and this one, you know, specifically has got very small flowers and a very vigorous growth pattern, which complements some of the other uh, flowering perennials that we have throughout the rooftop. The little blue stem. Um, obviously one of our native grasses um, and also one of our most resilient grasses. You know, at some point I think people felt like this was not such a pretty plant, but I think, um, you know, I personally love it and I love its resiliency within the urban environment. It's a little bit more upright than you'd find with the Sparabolus, um, but it does provide some nice kind of upright structure within the, within the green roof condition and a great kind of fall uh, and early winter color. And of course, I'm surprised I haven't gotten to goldenrod yet. Um, it's a kind of fixture in many of our projects. Um, there's all sorts of different types of goldenrod, uh, but the sweet goldenrod is one that we chose for empire stores. Um, and, you know, I think a lot of times traditionally people would see goldenrod uh, flowering at the same time as ragweed, and it's a common kind of misnomer that um, that you know goldenrod contributes to asthma and things like that. Um, I think that's found to not be uh, true, um, but I think you know this is one plant that really you know falls on the native spectrum, but falls on the urban spectrum, and provides kind of aesthetic value while also having all sorts of uh, medicinal and other qualities to it. So one of our kind of, I think, winners of this kind of emerging cosmopolitan flora. The Eupatorium uh, hisopifolium, also a great kind of complement to things like the goldenrod. Um, and again, creating these kind of cloud-like, um, you know, environments within the green roof. Um, the upright kind of growing structure is often supported by the plants around it. So it's important to kind of create that kind of urban meadow condition to support them, um, but will provide a kind of great balance to the grasses and other perennials selected. And then, you know, again, something uh, to hold together the garden um, from an evergreen standpoint throughout the winter to provide some amount of uh, structure um, and, give a kind of baseline layer to the garden um, so that it really registers uh, throughout the four seasons. I'm gonna move on to our Project 345 meatpacking um, in uh, 
the Meatpacking District of, of New York City. Um, this is what the Meatpacking District looked like uh, in the early 90s. You had um, loading canopies, uh, canopies over loading docks uh, in the area. And so we wanted to use that typology of the loading dock to create these, this kind of spontaneous garden as part of your entry sequence. So this is a 10 foot wide by 50 foot long garden that sits atop the residential entry to the building. It started out um, in the kind of rendering phase and thinking about what we wanted this garden to look like. Um, and, you know, also how could we create this kind of very shallow soil condition that would get, again, like the most amount of volume from the planting design itself. There's all sorts of other strategies used on the upper floors of the building to kind of soften the edges of the building and soften some of the mechanical systems um, that now live on, on the rooftops. And then we also thought, again, about the kind of four seasonality of the garden and through the creation of these bloom calendars, begin to think about the kind of layering or orchestration of the plants through the season. So this is the project um, after two years of installation I think um, it's brought in uh, retailers um, whose brand ethos really identifies with this kind of green approach. And you see the kind of really distinctive sumacs and the junipers spilling over the edges um, and some of the grasses kind of popping up and through, really creating this kind of wild garden. There's cutouts within that canopy um, that allow the plants to spill through. So in this case, this, this roof was heavily engineered to 75 pounds per square foot. And we um, tapered the soil um, in order to get the necessary soil depth for some of the sumacs from uh, two inches at the edges to 20 inches at its deepest. We also wove in other strategies like these parapet planters um, that have uh, things like um, Cecilaria and uh, butterfly weed and Sedum repestra um, and fescue. Um, these kind of shallow soil planters, I think these are 10 inches wide by 10 inches deep, that sit within the kind of parapet buildup and again provide some greenery uh, both to the interior as well as to the street. And then robust gardens on the rooftops as part of the kind of common rooftop amenity spaces uh, with, with yarrow and uh, fescue and more of the sumac and uh, coneflower and other flowering perennials. And then the bulkhead of the rooftop itself, um, again, much of the mechanical uh, systems for the building live up here. And so we thought about this was a nice opportunity to kind of soften that 30 foot wall um, and use a an, uh, grading uh, to grow vines up it. And then there are more kind of garden conditions for the different uh, penthouse units. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, this is one of my favorite plants. You'll see it on many of our projects. And it's obviously the kind of showstopper on the green roof canopy for this project, um, Roost Typhina, Staghorn Sumac. We often will get these uh, very small. They might be even five gallons or two to three feet in height. And those small statured plants at installation may not look you know, fantastic as a tree structure on day one, but they give the plant the most um, the strongest kind of chance of survival by uh, allowing it to kind of grow in and fill fill in over time. Um, and so many of these on the 345 meatpacking rooftop um, have gotten to be 12 to 15 foot tall. And it's obviously great flowers and fall color, which helps um, create a really interesting type of tree. <coughs> Pardon me. Um, the other thing I think I want to say about this plant in particular, people often ask, like, how can you maintain these these plants over time? And um, the thing with 
Bruce Typhena is that it will um, create colonies. And so even if you may lose one significant structure, one significant uh, branch uh, in the tree structure, there's always emergent suckers and shoots that are coming up. It, it does take a little bit of maintenance to kind of edit those. And I, I think a really good gardener to think about how you can kind of accent, accentuate this tree over time. But in the urban environment, that process of editing and selecting can, can really kind of make something like this thing. Um, and so these have become really kind of sculptural trees that are quite eye-catching. Sure, juniper, again, is kind of one of our structural plants. I don't want to say it's a background plant, but it does about give you the ability um, to do kind of more showy things on top of it. And again, provides that structure throughout the season. And then here we have uh, Cecilaria, um, a great uh, cool season grower um, that will remain predominantly um, uh, green throughout the year. Um, and uh, it's got kind of great structure within the garden and a rather low growing uh, profile. So again, doesn't uh, require a ton of soil depth. In this case, we used it in uh, 10 inches. Um, but provides great kind of structure within this kind of a perennial garden. And then another aster, of course, um, their kind of constant theme throughout here. Um, this one's much more low growing. It fits within the kind of profile that we've been showing in the parapet planters and some of the roofscapes. And then some of our self-sowing plants. So, this is a great strategy that you know, we learned, obviously, from a lot of um, uh, observation of urban environments is how can we um, you know, create uh, plants and landscapes which are ephemeral and kind of shift and drift over time. And so Scabiosa is a great plant for that uh, situation. It can be rather short-lived, um, a kind of temporennial, uh, people might call it. Um, but it does move around the garden, which prevents really kind of dynamic quality. Uh, similarly, um, the Latris, um, and there is a, a kind of native white flowering variety of this as well, um, can provide great kind of uh, showiness in the garden. Um, the spire comes up and, you know, will top out many of the other lower growing perennials and grasses. Um, and provide that kind of distinctive flower shape. Um, and again, it's self sowing so we often find it spreading throughout the garden, which again adds to kind of ephemerality from year to year. And then, as you saw on that uh, bulkhead image of the roof, um, the trumpet vine. And so there's uh, was actually on the rooftop, there was a number of vines planted, uh, three in total, but the trumpet vine really outperformed all of them um, as it is wont to do. Um, and its vigorousness allowed uh, that 30 foot wall to be covered within a kind of two to three foot time frame. Never will get to be 100% coverage, but what we often try to do in terms of mitigating our clients' uh, expectations is to think about how that might kind of take on a 60 to 80% coverage uh, from year to year. So our project um, at the Brooklyn Children's Museum is another rooftop application. <clears throat> so this is the rooftop of itself, itself in, in uh, progress of construction. This is an open air canopy uh, here, this kind of skeletal like frame that was designed by the architect Toshiko Mori. And our, uh, our scope of the project was to design the gardens and furniture um, underneath that canopy. You see that canopy dashed here in gray is a kind of diamond shape. It touches down at these four points. So there's a natural kind of inclination to make uh, quadrants throughout the rooftop itself. Overall, it's about 20,000 square feet, um, but we felt like we could take 
the interior program and begin to kind of pull it to the exterior. So where there's exhibit space on the inside, we might have this kind of flexible green that could accommodate uh, different um, activities um, <clears throat> adjacent uh, to the lower level lobby through a series of clear story windows. We could introduce a native woodland garden that would, uh, you know, show green to the people as they entered the building, kind of beckon people up to the rooftop, while providing a kind of immersive play condition uh, within a kind of native woodland environment for the kids, and then a dining uh, a dining area which pulled off the interior cafe, and then a lounge area. Um, which takes advantage of some of the natural shade provided along uh, this edge of the building. We start with renderings and kind of thinking about um, creating these kind of immersive uh, landscape conditions. And then in this particular project and, and many of the projects I've showed here today, we, we do the installation as well. Um, for me, that's just a really fun part of, of being a designer is being able to See these projects through and do something um, a little bit more complicated that we might not be able to design and document in the same way as many other traditional firms might. So here you see this kind of woodland walk being uh, installed and then the kind of finished product here. So it's all black locust uh, wooden deck and you see these kind of um, volumes of, of low growing grasses and ferns and structure of evergreens and then small trees, which being get to grow within this um, eight to uh, 18 inch soil profile. See the open air canopy in front with the woodland garden behind. And then standing in the woodland garden, kind of looking back towards the canopy itself. So we've got Magnolia virginiana and sassafras and Ilex glabra and Asclepius and lots of Carexes and ferns. And then we've got Agastache and Odaloa and Catalpa. Uh, Catalpa with its large leaves to really provide some shade and quick growing capability uh, along the building's southern edge. So to get to the plants, um, this is a plant everyone's obviously familiar with. It's not the most interesting, um, but it is one of my favorite plants. And you know, it's it's a plant we have to watch um, as well. I think as we we do find it self sowing in a lot of places, it could it could be an inv invasive plant of the future and some one to keep an eye on. But um, what it does for the urban environment is create really fantastic dappled light underneath it. So it's a great really, well, it's extremely rugged and can tolerate all sorts of difficult urban environments. It's a really nice tree to, to kind of sit and live under um, because of the type of light that it offers. So this was, uh, this was planted along, the, again, the southern edge uh, in concert with the catalpas to provide quick, quick growing trees that could offer shade um, to, to the uh, visitors to the garden. And then the catalpa itself, one of my favorite native trees with great flowers, great large leaves, and then these really interesting seed pods. Sassafras, one, one might not think this is an urban tree, and this is one that we're still experimenting with. Uh, but one of my favorite uh, native trees that you find growing in a lot of uh, upstate New York woodlands, um, it's got really interesting leaves, interesting color. Again, it's colony forming, which is one of the reasons why we think it might be a good candidate for other green roof conditions. So we're still exploring um, the, the success of this. But um, at Brooklyn Children's Museum, we've had, um, we found it to be very happy. The Carex Abernia, one of our kind of standout plants that you find on a lot of our projects. Um, it's low growing, um, it's clump forming, um, but in mass it can become almost like a carpet of green. 
Um, and, and it's very simple. Again, maybe not a background plant, but something that provides general structure and allows, allows other plants to really um, to step out and, and be more impactful. The Budaloa, um, or, or blue gam gramma grass, um, again, you saw that in the kind of perimeter planters, love the, um, the seed head and uh, the flower, and just uh, love the way that the, the plant kind of performs in mass over time. And Amsonia, or blue star, um, again, we often will plant this as a plug, very small, but within a year or two, you get these large masses, um, almost sh shrub-like, um, that have interesting soft foliage, great flowers, and then excellent fall color. So I'm sure you're all familiar with this, but this is one that we've been experimenting with, you know, how shallow of soil can we really put it in? The Agastaches, you know, obviously the mint family, the very vigorous growers it can be, it can, you know, in, in certain cases outperform other plants uh, to those plants' detriment. Um, so it's one to watch and edit, um, but it's a great complement to the overall palette that we're trying to create here. Great color, and again, very vigorous growth. So something that in a border you might put behind other things and allow it to really like fill in over time. And then the mountain mint, again, another one that um, can almost become shrub-like in its, its character and the way it can be planted in mass um, and uh, provide great structure within the garden. Again, one of my favorite plants. I'm gonna touch on um, a couple of uh, other projects that focus on lots and then I'll try to wrap it up from there. So this is Nowadays, which is a performance venue um, out in Ridgewood, Queens. It started as this kind of asphalt strewn lot. Um, it's 18,000 square foot site. It's a triangular site. There's a kind of central dance floor here with three earthen mounds, which frame uh, the space around the dance floor itself and provide places to kind of recline and sit back. Um, and watch the performance. And then a grid of honey locust trees across the entire site with uh, kind of built-in string lighting. Again, you see the, the honey locust and the roos, common, common favorites for us. Um, there's all sorts of programming that we thought about of how the site could shift and be dynamic over time. In general, it's a very low cost uh, installation, a really kind of funky space that we use color as a way of kind of creating interest within the project. There's a lot of outdoor activities and uh, food trucks and beer and ping pong, pretty fun space overall. And then on Sundays, they have a big dance party with a couple thousand people and it re really becomes like a, a place uh, for community to gather. I've brought my own kids there on a Saturday afternoon and hung out. Um, and it's almost like you're hanging out in somebody's backyard. So some of the plants that we use here, um, again, maybe not plants that we would traditionally use in the more garden environment, um, but this site had uh, no irrigation and a really rugged quality to it. And so we felt we could get away with some of these choices. So Eastern Cottonwood, um, really fantastic tree, but can be kind of weak wooded and you know, not necessarily desirable in many cases, um, but we liked it for its quick growing capability. So we got a lot of whips of this and we're able to plant them along the southern edge to create this kind of green entryway to the, um, to the performance venue. Gray birch was another one that we chose for its kind of quick growing capability. Um, we've got interesting bark, great kind of little catkins um, and just an interesting tree to kind of throw into the mix. Um, it's really adapted to difficult sites um, and, uh, you know, extremely successful nowadays. Euthamia, which is, I think, an overlooked plant in many cases, um, and one that we could definitely be using more of. Um, you know, used in mass, it creates these really beautiful drifts. Um, and a kind of great complement uh, to many of the other um, perennials that you'll find. 
chasmanthium, another kind of resilient grass that uh, can be used. Um, so these were on the used on the backside of many of the planting mounds, kind of underneath the roofs, um, alongside of uh, aster and some of the goldenrod. Here we use seaside goldenrod. Again, the kind of New England aster. And then we're able to drift in uh, seed mixes. And so looking at something like chicory, which has got this really beautiful pale blue, pale lavender flower, um, something again you might find on the side of a road, but it has the ability to really drift and be a part of um, a more garden environment. So that takes us just briefly into these opportunistic plants that have potential. So what I mean by that is plants that we find growing in our urban environment that we think might be able to kind of take the leap into being used in gardens, sometimes again, or sometimes in a kind of new fashion. So I'll flip through these really briefly um, and happy to take questions on these. Um, the narrow leaf plantain, spotted spurge, great for kind of prostrate and environments and growing up between the cracks of the pavement. Again, chicory, one of my favorite trees, and this is for discussion, um, but it's got the ability to be cut back. Um, it's got extremely large leaves and kind of beautiful flowers. It's great, a lot of great potential for this tree in the gar garden environment. Albizia, even white mulberry to a lesser extent, perhaps. Common toad flax or butter and eggs, as some people call it. Common milkweed. Even curly dock, you know, most people think this is not a desirable plant, and I, I could see their point. Um, but I think when you get into these urban meadow conditions, it goes brown, it's kind of dark brown early in the year, and really contrasts against some of the fall color that you get through the grasses and perennial. Common mullein. Um, my kids call this cowboy's toilet paper, but um, the ability to get these large spires, um, a biennial, so you'll often see just uh, the leaves emerge in the kind of basal rosette um, that then transitions into a spire in the second year. Virginia creeper, obviously one of our favorites, and then Indian goosegrass. So we're really excited about plants within the urban environment and constantly exploring how we could use those plants to benefit um, visitors to the city, not only from a sense of creating a kind of biophilic design of the city where people have a greater kind of connection and exposure to nature, but also through the, the resiliency of our urban environment to be able to manage um, the excessive heat and the excessive stormwater that we're finding as a result of climate change. So that's all for today. I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, David. That was uh, that was a great glimpse into some of these amazing projects that you've done. We do have a few questions for you. Do you know people who do this kind of work in the Los Angeles area? This is a question from someone who does garden, garden habitat for uh, local projects and she's interested in Los Angeles. That's great. Um, that's a great question. And I wish I had a compendium of firms that were doing this. And I'm, I'm sure that there are people that are out there that are doing it. I know of a couple of landscape architects that I feel like are doing some cutting edge work there in terms of planting design. I'm not sure if they specifically look at urban conditions quite as much. Um, but two firms that I might highlight uh, would be Terramoto um, Landscape Design um, and SALT Landscape Architecture, S-A-L-T. Very good. Thank you. Can you recommend a list of carbon sequestering plants that emerged from your research? That is a great question. Um, and I think further kind of research needs to be done on that. At some point, um, someone told me, you know, after I gave one of these presentations that, oh, well, that's, that's not 
really like a great ecosystem service. There's no way that this one tree could really have any effect. Um, you need a forest of trees, you know, in the city to be able to do that. And, you know, my feeling, well, this is this is kind of unfounded, I think, at this point, um, was that we, we do have a forest of trees. Um, you know, they might be Ilanthus and they might be Polonia and Mulberry and things like that. Um, but we do have a, a real forest of quick growing trees in the city. They're just not really looked at or mapped or kind of understood their, to their extent. Um, and so what we tried to do for the book uh, was highlight quick growing woody species with high leaf canopy indexes that had the ability to, to, to um, sequester carbon um, more so than other plants. And so I'm not sure if that is like the determining value judgment for, for what uh, would offer the most carbon sequestration capabilities, but we often find in our research that the woody plants that have are putting on a lot of growth year to year in their early phases uh, fit within that category of, of offering the most benefit in terms of carbon sequestration. Right. I'm sorry, I don't have a definitive plant list or answer there, but I would say really excited to have ecologists begin to kind of study that a little bit more to develop a matrix of plants, right? So what we do, we're, you know, landscape designers, and what we do is rather suggestive. You might call it designer science, you know, and I think what um, hopefully our work is inspiring people to do is take a closer look at the urban environment and inspire urban ecologists to greater study this so that we can come up with a matrix of plants um, and be able to better make value judgments as designers about which plants are appropriate in which places. Good. Does your book offer a list of weeds that should be tolerated or even encouraged? That's, that's a complicated question because I would say each site is different each state obviously has its own invasive plant list. So we included some plants um, within the book that are invasive in many states. And we didn't want to uh, just eradicate invasive plants because, um, because one particular state said that they were not beneficial or another. We wanted to kind of put a lens on those particular plants and have people discuss and, and, and think about where they might be appropriate. So while there's definite uh, problematic plants that have very little value, um, you might call, you might say Alanthus is one of those. Uh, you might say Phragmites is another daughter um, or even some of our uh, kind of cross vines. Um, you know, we're not trying to say with the book that every plant or every weed is wonderful but again, kind of open up a dialogue about what is appropriate. Okay. Other than fleabane, were there other fast growing self seeding annuals that you used and can recommend? Yes. Um, uh, so I think some of the, some of the plants, which I mentioned in the kind of last, panel the opportunistic plants with potential. Um, I think there's a lot there that could be kind of further studied. And so whether um, it's the narrow leaf plantain, which I just think is a really beautiful plant in and of itself, um, or the chicory, um, or um, even the toad flax, all of those kind of um, annual plants that can be um, bought through seeding, uh, bought through seeds and then used as kind of seeding strategies. Many of those will self-sow uh, over time and allow for this kind of more resilient uh, ephemeral garden. All right. Can you recommend a material source for the black locust that you used in the rooftop walkway? Yes, uh, that's a really interesting question. We, uh, over the past 10 years, have sourced uh, black locust from a number of different uh, uh, sites. Um, to be honest, I don't remember offhand 
the most recent supplier, um, but I believe they're down south. And it was the most uh, stable collection of black locusts that we found. Um, black locust, while you know an invasive tree itself, actually, um, uh, Rubinia pseudoacacia, you know, it it um, it's got the ability to be extremely quick growing and when dried properly, a great uh, hardwood lumber to use. Many times it's often not dried properly and it comes uh, to us either wet um, or kind of unstable and is therefore prone to kind of further checking and quite a bit of waste material in the wood itself. Um, I'm sorry, I don't remember the name of the firm that we used most recently, but it was a great batch of wood and I'd be happy to follow up with you, Penny, and give you that name uh, after this uh, presentation. Excellent. And then I can pass that along to the listener. Can you talk a bit more about the process of convincing your clients to use, the, use these type of non-traditional plants, or do you think that they seek you out specifically for your non-traditional approach? That's a, that's a great question as well. Um, I mean, I think, I think they sometimes seek us out because of our um, experience within designing landscapes into the kind of envelope of buildings in, in different and unique ways. Um, I don't think they're coming for us to, to, they're looking to us to often design a, a kind of weedy plant palette. Um, but they're looking for, I think, the expertise in terms of some of the more technical aspects of irrigation and drainage and soil profile that then kind of give uh, these kind of installations the ability to kind of grow over time. And it is difficult mitigating clients' expectations. Um, so, you know, whereas, uh, for example, the wall project with the window boxes that I showed, 41 Bond, that client was open from day one to having plants growing on the facade itself and in a somewhat unpredictable way. And so therefore, you know, we, we talked about and looked at the long-term implications of having, you know, the Boston Ivy on the walls and would that affect the masonry? And we did do some kind of due diligence to kind of research, um, you know, whether that plant would kind of degrade the facade. Um, but they were really open and accepting of that look. Uh, at another project, we ran into some issues. So now, for example, in Atlantic Plumbing, um, the plants were installed and I think very successful from our standpoint and photographed a bunch. And many of the photographs I showed were from the first two years. And then after that first two years, um, a different kind of management company took over and thought that the plants looked too unkempt and kind of too weedy and replaced many of them with more kind of tidy plants like liriope and other kind of low growing, you know, um, uh, kind of background plants. Um, so it, it can be difficult to mitigate clients' expectations. And you try to preface that as much as you can um, in your initial meetings and talk about um, the strategies uh, that you might employ and how that might kind of affect the kind of operation and maintenance and kind of life of the garden. All right, thank you. We have time for just one final question. Does your firm do ongoing management of these properties? And is that a conversation that you have up front with your clients? That's a great question as well. It is something that has evolved with us over time. Um, so not all of these projects, um, all of these projects we designed that I shared today, many of them we installed, and then a couple of them we also maintained. So we maintained 41 Bond and 345 Meatpacking, for example, um, for the first couple of years of the project. And for us, you know, that was really um, to learn and to understand what worked and what didn't work and um, how we could kind of change things that didn't work over time and then apply those strategies to future projects. So we do offer that um, and tell our clients that we have that capability. Um, from a practicality standpoint, we definitely don't take on every uh, maintenance job that we build. We kind of self-select particular maintenance projects that we think that 
we're doing something a little bit more experimental with and we want to kind of monitor how that garden evolves over time and then from a kind of feedback loop how how some of those um, evolutions then tie into some of our future design work. Excellent. Well, thank you, David, for sharing this inspiring information on urban potential and especially taking time to go into the detail about some of the plant palette that you use for various projects. Thank you all for attending. Good day and good gardening to you all. Thank you.